Welcome to the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller History Month 2013. I'll explain a little bit about the Gypsy, Roma, Traveller History Month here in Wales and a little bit about the actual symposium. We started the project back in 2009. We started with a small project in Cardiff Bay and since that initial contact in 2009, the project has grown in strength year upon year and it's all about policy, policy development. So bring in professionals like yourself who work in the actual field together in a forum to encourage debate. So getting Welsh Government, local authority, third sector, academics in one forum and to put recommendations forward to actually inform policy, to make things better on a practical level for Gypsy, Roma and travellers here in Wales. Um, I will hand over now to Dr Adrian Marsh, who will chair the event. Thank you very much, Isaac. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're very lucky this morning. We have two excellent opening speeches from Julie Morgan, who is a representative of the Assembly for Cardiff North and is chair of the cross-party group on Gypsies and Travellers, and she'll be giving us our first key keynote speech. And then we have Professor Thomas Acton, who is Emeritus Professor of Romney Studies at the University of Greenwich, um, who will be looking at the perspective from a, a wider European view in terms of looking at migration and mobility and um, Romney people moving across the continent in the current context. So I would like to introduce you to Julie Morgan. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm uh, delighted to be here again at uh, this um, symposium. And I'd like to congratulate Isaac again on putting together um, a very interesting, um, you know, stimulating programme. And I know that um, we will all get, um, get a lot um, out of the day. And I'm so pleased there are so many uh, people here. Um, I spoke last year here at this symposium, um, having recently set up the cross-party group on gypsies and travellers um, in the Assembly. Um, before going to the Assembly, I chaired the Traveller Law Reform Group, the all-party um, parliamentary group in the House of Commons in Westminster, because I'd been an MP before I became an Assembly member. And it seemed to me that when I came uh, to the Assembly, that there was um, a need to have a similar sort of group um, in the Assembly, um, as most, many of the issues are obviously related to travellers are devolved, and it seemed really important to me that there should be um, a place, a platform in the Assembly, um, which is the National Assembly for Wales, where um, gypsies and travellers could speak up and where Assembly members could advocate on their behalf. And the Welsh Government had recently um, published their Travelling to a Better Future document, which I think is available um, on the stalls at the side. And I felt this was a very forward-looking document. And it was a great opportunity to build on what the Welsh Government was doing by having a group to speak up um, on behalf of travellers. So the group has had a fairly short life. Um, but what, is, what has it achieved um, and I'm pleased to say that the meetings um, have been well attended um, by gypsies and travellers from, um, well, all over South Wales, and we've had North Wales um, coming in on video uh, links. Um, you know, people have come, you know, lots of people from Cardiff, Swansea, Brecon, um, uh, Monmouthshire, Cumbran, all those sort of areas. And a lot of children have come, especially from Swansea, where, of course, there's been quite a nasty dispute going on about um, building the second site. The National Assembly for Wales, for those of you who have come from some distance, um, will know that it is a relatively new body. Um, it's only 13, 14 years old, and it is establishing itself as the main focus for debate in Wales. And it did seem to me very important that gypsies and travellers, and Roma, of course, and we haven't addressed the needs of Roma yet in the group, but we do intend to do so, should recognise that they've got a place in the Assembly, that they've got somewhere to go, somewhere to lobby, and that the, the, the point of the National Assembly for Wales, as far as I'm concerned, is to be an inclusive body that speaks up for everybody in Wales. And so that was for one of the reasons that we, you know, we started this um, group. We want gypsies and travellers to see politicians as being there, not just to make a fuss when a site is proposed, but also to be there, you know, but to be there to speak up on, on their behalf. And, you know, we wanted them to have ownership. Um, and that's not a, a, an easy 
thing to do, but I think we've made a step in the right direction by establishing the group, having uh, lots of gypsies and travellers coming to the meetings and being recognised as a thriving group. Um, what we've done in our meetings, we've launched, um, initially at the initial meeting, we launched the Road Ahead, which analyses the Welsh Government's um, approach. Uh, approach. Uh, we've had meetings on health, education, we've looked at the issue of stigma, and this Wednesday we'll be having a meeting looking at how the media portrays um, travellers with speakers from um, Travellers Times, ITV, Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Children's Commissioner. So this will be a good opportunity um, to look at how the media operates. Um, the meetings are open to anybody who wants to come, um, but obviously we have, to know, uh, we have to have some idea of numbers. But whenever we discuss all these issues, as you know, usually happens, we always get back to the fundamental question of where the gypsy travellers have got enough sites and whether they've got anywhere to live, because obviously education, health, stigma, media, portrayal, all these issues are affected by the adequacy of site provision. And recently, some of you may have seen the BBC uh, documentary that looked at the provision of sites in Swansea um, and in Newport. Um, and, you know, expose some of the tensions rate related to those uh, proposed new sites. Um, in 2009, the Welsh Government estimated that there were 2,000 gypsies and travellers um, on sites in Wales. That's authorised and unauthorised sites, out of a total of 4,000, because obviously many gypsies are living um, in houses. It was important that the Welsh Government recognise that home can include a caravan wherever it's parked on authorised or unauthorised um, encampments. And so Article 8 um, does apply to caravans on unauthorised encampments as well as authorised sites. And this year, the last caravan count carried out um, in January this year. I don't know whether the, July, the next one is in July, I think next month. In January 2013, there were 924 caravans counted in Wales which is an increase of 13% um, over the previous year. 803 were on authorised sites, that's 87%, and 121 caravans were on un un unauthorised sites, and 38 of those were on land that was actually owned um, by gypsies. Uh, the councils with the largest number of unauthorised caravans, uh, there were six councils, Carmarthenshire, Swansea, Newport, Vale of Glam, Flint and Anglesey, six out of the 22 councils, and many local authorities have no um, sites at all. Um, it seems to me, you know, the population of Wales is 3.5 million people, and we're actually only talking about providing accommodation um, for 4,000 people um, at the most. And it doesn't seem to me that it's very much to ask that this small number of people should have their human rights respected and that they should all have somewhere to live. Um, I'm sure many of gypsies and travellers who live in houses are living there because there aren't adequate sites and because of the uncertainty um, of the site uh, provision. So I'm sure many gypsies and travellers living in, in houses would actually prefer to um, um, live on sites. Um, and so, I mean, even if all of those people were included, it would only be 4,000. And I think it is something that must be tackled. And I think there is now um, a determination to tackle it. Um, I think there is pressure coming from many different sides to ensure that there is adequate um, site pr provision. You know, for example, here in Cardiff, the uh, local development plan, the LDP, um, was referred uh, by the Welsh inspector, uh, was referred back by the Welsh office inspector because of the lack of gypsy sites. So Cardiff is now, um, have, you know, looking at where it will provide the necessary gypsy sites. However, there is good news. Um, in its housing white paper, the Welsh Government has included a duty on local authorities to provide local authority sites where the, where the need exists. And I do believe that this is a big step forward, that the Welsh Government has actually um, decided to do this. Um, as we all know, there used to be a duty on local authorities, but this was removed um, by the Criminal Justice Act um, in the early 1990s. And while that duty did exist, many local authority sites were developed, but came to a stop, really, the building after the Criminal Justice Act. Um, the consultation on the housing white paper, um, the Welsh Government's housing white paper, has finished. And um, in the consultation uh, responses, the reimposition of a duty is generally um, welcomed, but there are some reservations by the local authorities. 
But I I'm confidently expect the duty will appear in the housing bill. Um, and I think it is um, you know, important to note um, that the Welsh Government is providing 100% funding for new sites. Um, and already many sites have been um, refurbished. So I believe there is the opportunity for there to be a better time. And if you actually look at what the, um, what the white um, paper um, says, it says um, the evidence in gypsy and traveller accommodation needs assessments and local development plans identifies a clear and urgent need for new sites. However, local authorities have been unable to progress plans to develop new sites. Current legislation imposes various duties on local authorities. It requires them to have regard to the provision of suit suitable and sufficient sites in their area, but falls short of an explicit statutory requirement, and problems are experienced when trying to obtain planning consent, as we all know. The situation cannot continue, where the need for gypsy and traveller sites has been identified and not met by the relevant local authorities. We will place a duty on them to ensure they take action to provide them. We will introduce a statutory duty on local authorities to provide sites for gypsy and traveller communities where need has been identified. So there is a clear lead there from the Welsh Government, and if that is then reflected in the housing bill, I think we have the basis for moving forward um, in Wales to sort out this long-running difficulty. Um, there are other issues that um, need to be sorted out. Um, the Housing and Regeneration Act in 2008, um, the Westminster Act, amended the definition of protected sites in the Mobile Homes Act to include local authority gypsy and traveller sites in England. Um, well, it was England and Wales, but in England this was actually brought in in 2011, but it still hasn't been brought in in Wales. Um, but we are in the process um, of um, bringing in, um, in some um, legislation. But there is um, a consideration being given where is the best place for disputes between the local authority and the gypsies of travellers, whether it should be dealt with in the county court or whether it should, uh, could go to the, should go to the residential property tribunal. And that is something that is going to be debated um, in the Assembly fairly soon. And I think the recommendation is that it should go to the residential property tribunal, but we do have some concern about that because we think there may not be enough help available there um, in terms of people being aware of the needs of uh, a vulnerable group of people where their literacy rates may be low and we fear that um, if it does go to the residential property tribunal not so much help may be available but that is something that's actually happening um, in the Welsh Government at the moment and I understand it's going to be debated on um, July the 9th. Um, so those are just two important issues which are under consideration at the moment um, in the um, Welsh um, Assembly, the Welsh Assembly uh, Government, the duty um, that is going through and the protection of tenants um, on local authority sites who are gypsies and travellers. Uh, so I think there is progress going on in the Assembly. I think that um, the um, human rights of gypsies and travellers are being um, recognised. I think we have a basis to work on. The messages are there. Um, the delivery has to be with the local authorities, and I think we have to give as much um, support and um, confidence to the local authorities as we can to um, carry out what is going to be um, their duty. Uh, and I hope that the, the climate in Wales about, camp, about um, provision for gypsies and travellers will change. And then finally, I want to say that, um, as I said um, early, uh, earlier in my speech, that um, we have not yet as a group um, engaged with, uh, with the Roma, um, and this is something that we intend to do because I have had discussions with you know, people who are here today, and we are going to take this forward, and hopefully we will have a meeting um, in the autumn where I hope that um, uh, you know, some of you may be able to tend, attend. So thank you very much, and I'm... Uh, I'm going to be able to stay here for the morning session and I'm really looking forward to hearing what I know is stimulating international perspectives, but I'm glad we've been able to start about what we're trying to do in Wales, in the Welsh Government and in the Welsh Assembly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julie. Now, Thomas, um, some of you may remember again from uh, who came last year. Thomas has been um, engaged with Romani studies and Romani activism for a, uh, for a number of years and has also been a supervisor to a number of us in terms of our 
academic careers as well as being a kind of guide for our more active, um, uh, our more active engagement with Romney politics. So, Thomas. All right, thank you. It's curious, nearly 40 years ago, I was staying in Julie's home. I'd come to visit her mother, Grace, who was running the voluntary, non-state funded education project with gypsies in Cardiff. And that takes us back to a time when actually the British state didn't even necessarily accept gypsies into school. Number of things to say about that. First of all, the importance of continuity. Julie's here and I'm here, right? The past 40 odd years in Cardiff have not been just a succession of starts and stops and starts and stops. There has been an accumulation of wisdom and evidence. Secondly, how far we've come. Sometimes we think the system is terrible, but if it wasn't, and I just pay tribute to your mother now, if it wasn't for people like your mother saying that the not letting children into schools is unacceptable. Right? I mean, you'll read in your history books that education became compulsory probably in the 19th century. It didn't actually. It didn't become compulsory till 1906 for everybody. Um, when a duty was placed on local authorities to accept people in. Where local authorities didn't provide schools in remote rural areas, uh, there wasn't necessarily everywhere. But it wasn't applied everywhere the same. There was a duty on, placed on parents to send their children to school, but actually neither under the 1906 Act or the 1944 Education Act was there a duty placed on the local authority to accept children from outside their area. All right. And of course, they said that it wasn't. Now that's not our subject today, that's an old story, but it's one we shouldn't forget, right? It took people like Julie's mum going down and teaching amongst caravans in the mud to shame the authorities into saying, yes, we will make provision for gypsy and traveler children. Now I'm going to depart from the conventional script a bit. Because actually, I mean, I was there, your mum was, I don't know how old then, and I was just a student, what? Um, well, 40 years ago I was 24, so that <laughs> tells you something. It seems an incredible long time. It's a lifetime ago. And it's important that we don't forget what was happening then. Because, of course, both your mum and I were both socialists and we looked to socialism in Eastern Europe as providing something which with all its faults we didn't get here. And one of the things we looked to is that there were educated gypsies in Eastern Europe. Right? I, w I visited the um, Hungarian parliament and spoke to the um, the national officer in charge of gypsy education in Budapest, and um, you know, put some reproachful things about uh, discrimination against gypsies in Hungary to her. And she kind of chuckled and she said, tell, tell me, Mr. Acton, she said, um, how many gypsies do you have students in your universities? This is in 1979. I said, well, I don't know of any. How many lawyers? How many MPs? And of course, there were a number of pioneers. Um, Ilona Latskova in Slovakia, training the first qualified social worker from Charles Universities. 
There were a pioneer of Romani intelligentsia. <clears throat> and we met some of them at the First World Romani Congress in 1971. People who were involved in Romani politics in this country, we made pilgrimages to Skopje in Macedonia, a whole town where every town councillor was a Romani and they had a Romani MP and so forth, and where you could walk out in the streets and you'd hear nothing but the Romani language spoken. And of course, everybody who went and saw that came back saying, why can't we have that here? Right? I've just learned something today. I won't give any names. But one of the students at Cardiff University in the group going there was a Scottish traveller. He didn't tell anybody he was a traveller as he was a student there. There were travellers and gypsies in our universities. Because of racism, they had to keep their identities secret. In a sense, those people were almost lost to the gypsy people. Or were they? I know a number of people now who admit their traveller background who back then, even when they were working in the traveller movement, I can think of a teacher in London I know who's now one of the stalwarts of the Romani and Traveller Family History Society. She was working as a traveller teacher back then and she never told anybody that she was a traveller. So the contrast between that racism, which actually was internalized also by Romani people, incredibly self-damaging to them back in the 60s and 70s. The first cracks in that in Europe did not appear in Western Europe. They appeared in Eastern Europe. Right? So when we go on about the da danger that communism, the, da the damage that communism did to people, much of it true, the authoritarianism, the poverty that their economic system couldn't in the end cure. The class system where they replaced one class by another, um, the inequalities that they couldn't in the end cure, even despite the formal equality. We shouldn't forget that actually one of the big things which cracked the historic racism against Romani people in Europe as a whole was communism formally outlawing uh, it. And then in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell and the kind of formal illegality of racism declined and almost immediately people said, we're free. We don't have to be nice to gypsies anymore, right? When we speak about what communism failed to do for Romani people, we shouldn't forget that for 40 years they did make formal racism illegal. They didn't stop it happening, they didn't stop discrimination altogether, but at least they made that start and they created the beginnings of the Romani intelligentsia and without that Romani intelligentsia, the Romani movement in Europe today would be very different to what it was. But of course, as it, and to, to our friends from Eastern Europe who maybe can't remember, you know, who feel that the people who said, oh, not everything was bad under communism are just nostalgic for their, their old slave masters. Don't forget that without the example and the inspiration from a few educated Roma from Eastern Europe, the, the movement of gypsies and travelers and Roma in Western Europe would be very different. It was from people from Eastern Europe who in the end showed Romani people in Western Europe that it isn't impossible to be educated and a gypsy. The racist lie that had been repeated from generation to generation, which many people even internalized, right? So in that sense, without those examples from Eastern Europe, we wouldn't have had the success in Western Europe that we had. And of course, it's because of the legacy of that, the legacy of people like Julie's mum in the traveler education movement, that we do have a cadre of people in the administration in Britain who 
instead of saying, oh my God, it's terrible, more gypsies coming from Eastern Europe, saw it as an opportunity. Oh yes, what can we do? Who, when they saw the, the Roma migrants beginning to go to our universities, um, used that as an example to English gypsies. And English gypsies saw it too and said, we can do that too. Who realized right from the beginning that actually the migration of Roma to Britain was one of the best things that could happen for Romani people as a whole in Britain. Right, now to my specific topic, what I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> what is the background of Roma from Eastern Europe and why are they coming? Well, I've put up something here. This on the, there's, that's a group of the, the Jobbik um, militias in Hungary. Fascist thugs who are now represented in the Hungarian parliament going round and doing unofficial policing, i.e. intimidation, of Romani areas, right? Blown up very much in the past five or six years. That's why we're beginning to see new flows from Hungary beginning to reach the scale that we've seen from some other East European countries before. Um, on the left, it's not going unanswered. That's a rally in Miskolc, a Hungarian town. You can see a Romani flag there, people marching against it. It's not the case that there's no resistance to um, racism in Hungary. There are brave people doing it. But if you're a family with young children, there's no shame in thinking that you don't want to put your life on the line. Um, in Canada at the moment, uh, somebody who was a Romani MEP for the Socialist Party in the last uh, European Parliament, Victoria Mohachi, is in the middle of her, or just about to begin her asylum he uh, hearing in Canada. The Canadian government, unbelievably, is claiming that Hungary is a safe place for Roma. Victoria is giving evidence about the death threats and other things that she's received. Of course, there is still one Hungarian Romani MEP in the European um, Parliament. Uh, Livia Jaroka, whom some of us know, uh, she's a member of the Conservative group. Um, and I must confess, when she got elected there, some of us thought, well, she's sold out. I have to say, I mean, she's a kind of a Cameronite Tory opportunist. She was a PhD student of Michael Stewart in London. She's putting the best case. I must, I, you know, I have to say this for her. Given the weakness of her hand, she's played a political blinder. She's doing her very best in the position she is to affect the institutions from within, to prevent the Fish Fidesz party from going down to become an ally of the fascists. And it still is a good, I mean, in some ways, it's a bad thing that there are fascists in the Hungarian parliament. One of the reasons there are fascists in the Hungarian parliament is because the Hungarian Conservative Party, the Fidesz, has kept them out of the Conservative Party. So the Fidesz is not a fascist party. Good news. Bad news that there are some Fidesz members of party who would like an alliance with the fascists. Bad news is that the Prime Minister is one of these egocentric guys who wants it all his own way and is unwilling to admit he's ever made a mistake. There's everything to play for, and it's not dishonorable to be in her position. Trying to make the best of the situation that there is. And that's not incompatible with the fact that members of the defeated Socialist Party are getting threats and are the, um, the uh, the object of racist attentions. So we should support 
Victoria Mohachi's demand for asylum in Canada. Uh, and we also have to offer critical support to Livia Iroka doing what she can. And that doesn't mean that we adopt conservative politics, um, but they're both showing bravery in different ways. So it's a complex situation. Now, the story we often hear is that because of the racism which started in 1989, um, that's why the Roma have come here. And then, of course, the people like Jason Kenney, the Canadian immigration minister, say, no, that's not true. Uh, they're modern liberal governments. And they're doing what they can to you get racist nuts everywhere. Uh, not enough. Um, but on our side, we say, no, ra a demon of racism has been let loose um, since 1989. And until we manage to change the culture to say that racism isn't within the bands of acceptable free speech, um, then we're going to get these attacks on Roma. However, if we just start history in 1989, we lose a lot of things. Um, so I'm going to start from 1989 and go backwards instead of going forwards, right? And those who believe in social policy are going to say, ah, but we want to know about the present. Um, but unless you know about the past, you can't understand the present. 22nd of May, 1989, the EU Council of Ministers passed its most radical resolutions ever in favour of Roma and travellers, in favour of education. Right? You go back and read them sometime. They're a lot more radical, they're a lot more demanding, they're a lot more pro-Roma than anything in the Charter for Roma Integration or the Delayed of Roma Integration or any of the recent stuff. They demand equality for Roma as, East, as European citizens. Whereas, let's be honest, the decade of Roma Integration is, for God's sake, help these poor gypsies in Eastern Europe because we don't want them all coming to Western Europe. Still that racist paradigm, right? What happened? Uh, to those resolutions. Well, the resolutions were passed on 22nd of May 1989. On 9th of November 1989, the Berlin Wall fall fell. And uh, five years later, I got a call, a telephone call, from the representative of the, Euro uni uh, the University of Greenwich in Brussels. I mean, that may sound a bit grandiose, but way back then, um, the less experienced universities like mine thought that there was a whole well of gold in Brussels that they could just tap into and that it was worth their while to keep somebody permanently in Brussels. And she rang me up from Brussels and she said, well, I was looking through a cupboard the other day and I opened it and a whole load of reports fell out and it was a report on what governments had done to implement the uh, resolutions of the 22nd of May 1989. Have you seen it? I said, no, I'd never heard of it. I didn't even know it had been published. She said, oh, I'll send you some. I said, send me the lot. I can sell them on my bookstore. <laughs> they sold like hot cakes. The European, uh, the European Union had printed exactly 250 copies of that report. They distributed them by sending them two copies to each then member state. Uh, one was sent to the House of Commons where they put it in the library, where at the, the time that I got this phone call it was awaiting um, awaiting cataloging, and the other one was sent to the Department for Education, and we never did find out where that had ended up. Um, they buried it. So I rang up the man who wrote it, Jean-Pierre Liegeois, who used to be a big name in European Roman studies, and I rang him up and I said, oh, congratulations, uh, je viens de lire votre rapport. And he said, mais il n'est pas publié maintenant. 
He said, it hasn't been published yet. I said, oh, yes, it has. He said, it must be a draft. I said, no, it says final version. They hadn't even told the author of the report that it had been published. They buried it. And why did they bury it? Well, they wanted to make sure oh, that people forgot about it. Because from 1989, the perspective which had been building up from the 70s, when we, were, when we met in Cardiff, right through to 1989, there was steady progress aimed at bringing equality for the Roma who already were in Western Europe. From then on, the priority of the powers that beat in the Eastern Europe was to keep the Roma where they were in Eastern Europe, and you weren't going to do that by making things any better for the Roma in Western Europe. And so instead of these economiums, we got measures aimed mainly at keeping Roma in Western Europe, uh, in Eastern Europe, trying to force the governments of Eastern Europe to be nicer to them. Um, I'm often asked, why is this important? Why do people need to know about Romani culture? So I'll just go about that because it's, for those of you who are in social services or anything, um, what do I get asked about as an expert when I'm called in, for example, for consultation over a child protection case? And often, basically, the query is, is this behaviour an individual pathology or a cultural aberration? And social workers often make errors both ways. And, you, you know, you sometimes find yourself saying, no, no, incest is not an old Romani cultural tradition. In fact, sometimes even we have to say that at the university level, as the um, hue and cry over Professor Jesneski at the uh, Covernus University in Budapest shows. Equally, we sometimes have to go the other way and saying, well, no, um, you know, leaving an older child in a younger, in front of a younger child, uh, this is what people are, are used to doing, used to having general family control. It's not evidence of a particular careless mother. If you tell them we don't allow that in England, then they won't uh, do it. And what we do, of course, and it's particularly hard with um, child protection issues, worse than immigration issues, criminal issue, general criminal issues, uh, planning issues, because in those other areas we get an accumulation of wisdom. But in child protection, because everything is confidential, people tend not to learn from other people's case histories. And what we're doing is we're comparing um, individuals' behavior with a series of cultural uh, narratives. And of course what's difficult is because of the different cultures between different Gypsy, Roma, and Traveller groups, we get many generalizations which are wrong. And um, the other reason why we need general study is because, particularly in Britain, in Western Europe, where there's this tradition caused by racism of Gypsies, Roma, and travellers who are getting on with their lives quietly, not to draw attention to their ethnicity. The Gypsy, Roma, and traveller families who come to the attention of police, teachers, and social workers are the ones who've um, got problems. And so police, social workers, and often health workers too, um, think that all travellers have problems. I can remember the report on traveller health, we're doing that later, which said, um, it said practically every gypsy parent in the southwest should be liable to prosecution for child neglect uh, because of the state of their children's teeth. And I immediately rang up uh, the Devon uh, Travel Education Service supervisor and said, what's all this? And she said, oh, that can't be true. All the families I know send their children to dentists privately. Um, and you see where that false statement comes up. I'm not saying that travellers don't have individual health problems or there aren't 
You don't need cultural sensitivity um, on the part of health workers. Of course you do. But the demography is often misleading because um, travelers are more likely to go into houses at the end of their life. So yes, of course, people living in trailers are on an average younger than people living in houses. Um, there are a whole range of things which skew those figures. Um, so we get that reinforcement of na uh, narrative stereotype, uh, of negative stereotypes, and we get the sad fact that the gypsies who are more self-reliant because they're hidden from view, are less likely to come back in and be part of the, if you like, the struggling community. Um, how do we deal with that? And the answer is that we have to, we have to combat the racism which makes people hide themselves so that more and more Romani people do come forward. That is happening, and we do that by rewriting the history which led to racism. And as we do that, too, the history will um, itself correct the stereotypes, we hope. But we have to self-consciously set ourselves to do that. Um, so let's just go through what, and here, I really wish Adrian, who is a historian, was speaking rather than I. Um, how should we be challenging those narratives? And starting right from the beginning, why did the people who speak, the, why did the ancestors of the people who developed the Romani language emigrate from India? And the traditional story is that they were pariah nomads who just wandered a bit further. But why is a mystery? And that acceptance of the word, oh, it's a mystery, is an indication of our racism. Mystery is not a historical explanation. If the mystery implies something impossible or magical, then it's not true. The history of Romani people is something that has to be possible, believable, and understandable. And we shouldn't rest until we've got plausible narratives. Commercial nomads do not wander further under feudalism, and they can't do it because they need protectors. People would just rob them. I had a PhD student who was a Baluch nomad, but not a commercial nomad, a pastoral nomad. His father owned camels. He also land, owned the land the camels wandered on. He owned the villages, and more or less was the feudal lord of the villages too. And he also had quite a lot of gypsy dependents. When he was having a feast, he could summon gypsy musicians from different groups, uh, bone setters. Uh, Damari, he'd actually been circumcised by a dom, same group that uh, Adrian did field work with and met bone setters and traditional dentists uh, in eastern Turkey. Um, so he was used to it. How did those people, how Baluchistan? It's a very dangerous place. I wasn't allowed to go and visit him while he was doing his field work because he couldn't guarantee my life. Foreigners aren't allowed in there at the moment because of the civil war between Baluch nationalists and the Pakistan army. Um, how can people who are just sharpening knives or doing village people's teeth wander safely through all of those villages? They can do it because my PhD student, Nasir's dad, if anybody laid a hand on them, he would treat it as though they were attacking him personally. So anybody robbed them, he'd go after them and kill them. That's how feudalism works, right? It's a big protection racket. You get to work for the big boss for free, uh, but in turn, he guarantees your safety. Commercial nomads can only move if they've got protectors. And to set a long story short, um, the speculation which Adrian Marsh is responsible for, along with uh, our colleague Professor Ian Hancock uh, and various others like Marcel Cortiad, is that the ancestors of the Romani people were a variety of groups from India who were part of a militia in the service of the uh, Mahmud of Ghazni 
who retain their Indian identity or Hindu identity because Mahmud of Ghazni didn't want them converting to Islam and perhaps defecting to other rulers. And various people have said, well, that's a far-fetched um, speculation. But the point is that it is sociologically plausible. It could have happened, whereas the traditional story that they just wandered couldn't have happened. So it may be a, better, a, a, a far-fetched speculation, but it's a better speculation than any of the previous speculations. Why did people like... I mean, I'm not going into whether it's true or not, but why did people like Adrian actually produce a story like that? And the answer is, of course, is the second point there, is that those old racist myths that gypsies wander because it's in their blood were challenged by Romani nationalists. Um, in the first instance, they said we were war warriors and ventured, uh, uh, ventured to Europe. But that isn't enough either. It's because you've got, first of all, the challenge who said they were people like us. History has got to make sense. And then you've got to make it sociologically plausible. So in a sense, what the contemporary Romani historical revisionists, a mixture of West European and East European scholarship, a point of view made possible by the different ways in which, in the 60s and 70s, racism was challenged in the West and in the communist East, have produced this new speculation. Of course it's a speculation, but as I say, it's a more plausible speculation than any of the others. And it's sociologically plausible because it's social collectivities who've got some military political autonomy that give rise to continuing identities in a way which individual migrants do not. What do I mean by that? Well, of course, we've got lots of other migrants around the uh, world. We have lots of people from Bangladesh in Britain, but they're not a separate people. They're Bangladeshis in Britain. Why are Romani people or in Turkey, Domery people, not just Indian immigrants who've lost their Indian identity, because they had a separate identity forged as a people in Anatolia, which is probably where their language emerges as the command language of that army, bringing together the different dialects of what was probably a very multicultural army from India. The fact that they all spoke basic North Indian was one of the few social things they had in common. And that army loses its political military identity by 1361 at the very latest. If you want to know why, ask Adrian later. But many of its component sections retain the skills which enabled them to be commercial migrants and they could do those skills better than people in the Balkans to which they had migrated. So you get these people with Indian language in various groups, various caste traditions, moving into Eastern Europe and then moving into Western Europe uh, as refugees. And when you get, look at the earliest refugees in Western Europe, they clearly have the remnants of a military structure. They've got commanders who are very grand and well-dressed, and they've got followers who are very poor, right? I mean, it doesn't bother generals in our own army that the privates get paid much less than them. Did they have wonderful Romany solidarity? Did they heck? No. The leaders were always complaining to local rulers whom they treated as their feudal equals to try and get them to help keep their unruly, get their unruly servants back. And sometimes they did help them. They treated as feudal leaders with feudal leaders. In other words, you've got a military feudal structure until catastrophe hits in the 16th century. And what happens basically, the catastrophe is the end of overall religious orders and the beginning of the nation state. Henry VIII didn't say, uh, as Henry V had said, obey me because the Pope says I'm king. He got rid of the Pope 
And instead he said, obey me because you're an Englishman. And we're attacking foreigners. And who were the foreigners that suffered? Black people under Elizabeth began to get sent back to Africa. Jews uh, made illegal by Elizabeth I, but they had somewhere to run to. Gypsies, dark-skinned, and uh, foreigners, and nomads, migrants. Uh, vagrancy was the word vagrancy was the equivalent of scrounger then, right? So you get a massive persecution, but not just in England. You get it across Europe. The nation state, the foundation of the nation state in the 16th century, is a huge, contra, uh, huge catastrophe for Romani people. How do they survive it? Well, again, I'm cutting a very long story short. Um, in some communities, in the more imperial communities, it's not as big a um, catastrophe as in others. So in the Ottoman Empire, north in the Russian Empire and in Poland, um, they become taxable communities or appendages to other taxable communities. Uh, maybe there's inequalities involved there, but take it from me, you're a bit you're a lot better off if the government's problem is how they're going to collect taxes from you than how they're going to get rid of you. Uh, we find them as slaves, particularly on the Christian fringes of the Ottoman Empire, and as marginalized commercial nomads in Western Europe. Um, and that, basically, is what creates the objects of European racism between the 16th and the 19th century, right? And then in the 19th century, it's all shock up again uh, because, well, basically the steam engine. America, Roma can escape to America, millions do. Uh, from Eastern Europe, slavery has ended. They come to Western Europe, um, but also across Europe, the state is becoming more authoritarian and the marginalized commercial nomadic existence in Western Europe is becoming unacceptable. And the anti-gypsyism, the developing anti-gypsyism, fueled by the scientific racism from the end of the 18th century, starting with Grauman, uh, leads to a new forms of, first of all, forced assimilation, and of course, genocide. Um, and the Nazi genocide, in fact, is what shows that the traditional ways of surviving the catastrophe of the 16th century no longer worked. And so we get the new gy gypsy politics. And that actually, that's before the First World Romany Congress, but numbers of people I knew in 1969 going to Strasbourg, holding up a Romany flag, that's even before we'd got the Romany flag you saw in the first slide. Right? An embryonic state of uh, gypsy politics demanding something new. Um, and of course, that gypsy politics, there's a continuity between that and the Eighth World Romani Congress just happened in Sibiu, but it's responding to a different situation. Um, so let me just kind of conclude by asking what are the sources and dimensions of Romani gypsy cultural diversity today. One of the most important ones is the difference in the social control systems. Uh, and I argue that you can, you can almost, you can see three dimensions of sources of legitimacy in Romani communities. Tradition, consensus, and personal autonomy. So if you look at the English gypsies, personal uh, autonomy is very important. Every man is king in his own family. Nobody can tell him what to do. You want to sort out problems? In the end, there has to be a fight. Tradition, the Polish Roma. Tradition embodied in a Baro Shero who lays down the laws, it always has been. You've got a problem, you go to the older people to resolve it. And then, slightly differently, the tradition of the, of the Vlach Roma um, of consensus of having a court, but one where the warring parties choose the judges. So elders, judges, family heads. There's a lot more I could say about that,
but it makes a tremendous amount of difference. And then, of course, people come from different European countries. Um, the Polish Roma, of the, of the Roma's... Uh, the Roma support group in London, most bureaucratic-minded Roma I've ever come across. The only place where kind of Roma who've recently immigrated and sitting around a committee and say, excuse me, Mr. Chair, a uh, point of order, is that in accordance with our constitution and standing orders? Uh, I've never come across a gypsy organization, but used to in state bureaucracy. When people have got uh, that experience, from particular interactions with state uh, things, that happens. And it doesn't hurt also that those particular Roma who did that were Jehovah's Witnesses. The religion, the growth of Pentecostal and Jehovah's Witnesses over the, I mean, Pentecostals much, much more than Jehovah's Witness uh, over the um, past 50 years is enormously important. So the influence of religion makes a great deal of difference Education, the legacy of state socialism, um, particularly with Polish Roma, is the fact that their children were being thrown out of school. So it's just one of the main things that drove the migration. Right? I remember a Polish Roma uh, father in 1991 living in an absolute slum in King's Cross, a family of about six living in two rooms, walls covered with the drawings of their children from school. And he, he looked at me with a big smile. He says, it's wonderful here, he said. Our children don't get out, thrown out of school. They want our children in school. They love to talk to us, the teachers, he said. And there's people from everywhere here. And he said, our wives can walk down the streets in their long dresses and nobody throws stones at them. And I thought, well, you know, London... That made me feel quite proud to be a Londoner in that moment. Nobody throws stones at them. We've got an enormous strength in this country. We actually... Yes, there's a lot of racism. I know there is. But we're not what's happening in France. We're not what's happening in Italy. Italy destroyed uh, the work of the traveller education movement in the 1990s under the first Berlusconi government. The... Traveller education movement, it's under attack at the moment. It's been cut savagely, but it's still there. It's not gone away. And the people who are in, in favour of Roma and travellers, Julie, we're not going to go away, are we? And it's not just us old people, it's young people. Uh, you know, I can die happy. Now, I used to be worried, if I, if I don't do something, nothing will happen. Uh, well, it's having students like Adrian that, make, that makes me happy to die. Uh, so that came out wrong. <laughs> language, language and dialect, politics and class, um, and I just listed a few of the... Uh, I know I've got to finish, so I won't uh, go on uh, further. And there are some organisations there, and you can get more contacts with that. I'm sure um, Isaac can organise the distribution of my notes if, if, uh, if you, you need to be. There are sources... And, um, yeah, we, de we, we have to keep on fighting because we daren't give up. I'll finish there, Adrian. Thank you very much. I just want to make one little clarification, Thomas, from my end, which is that um, the decade of Roma inclusion, whilst it may have a dubious uh, political agenda behind it in terms of keeping uh, East European Roma in Eastern Europe, to some extent, it does also feature countries like Spain, uh, and the United States, who are members. And the last meeting of the decade in Croatia this week, last week, sorry, last Wednesday, um, also invited Turkey and a number of other countries in Western Europe to join. So it's an expanding and reorienting initiative. Oh, oh yes. I mean, of course, <laughs> from the position of anybody in the... Um, anybody in the bureaucracy needs to go along with the possibility possibilities. Politics is the art of the possible. That's why, for example, it would be absolutely foolish to denounce Livia Yaroka as merely a fig leaf. She's um, I'm gonna, a whole lot more than a fig leaf, but that, even that would be enough. No, she's a brave and committed parliamentarian doing her utmost duty as a pragmatic conservative to 
do the best you can from within the situation that we can. And the paradox of democracy is that it actually requires the collaboration of people in active disagreement with each other to produce the, uh, the best possible thing. So in a democracy, our political opponents are also always our collaborators. Um, and we should never forget that. So all respect, you know, I mean, if, if Livia Yaroka calls on any of us for help, we should give it without thinking twice. At the same time, we shouldn't forget the truth, which is that the decade of Roma integration is much more modest in its aspirations than what the, the uh, European Union actually published as its aspirations back in 1989.